We've got a picture of the watershed uh, with the Vadnais Lake Area Water Management Organization. It's 25 square miles and all of this water drains into Vadnais Lake. So we are the stewards of what is St. Paul's drinking water. Um, Goose Lake is the first headwater, so to speak, that goes to Lambert Creek, then into Vadnais Lake. Next. This is a historic photograph of what Goose Lake looked like in 1856. Uh, Goose Lake was more of a wetland. It was a very shallow lake wetland, and because wetlands act like a sink for nutrients, it's like a factory to process those, uh, there was a lot going on historically in Goose Lake. All that sediment, all that soil was holding a lot of nutrients and with development uh, it became a lake. So that richness is still there and uh, that's what we're working with. Uh, there's a history of sewage from the city of White Bear Lake being dumped in from the late 20s to the early 60s and all of these things combined makes Goose Lake a very unique water body. So uh, that's why we're so glad you're here because multiple strategies, multiple people involved are going to be the way to help that out. With the next one, this is the sub-watershed. So within our watershed, this smaller area drains to Goose Lake itself. Uh, we've got White Bear Lake here, a bit of Gem Lake golf course. If you live in that area, your efforts, what's on your property, on your street, is a piece of this big puzzle. Um, all the storm drains and the runoff will be going into Goose Lake. Next, we have 10 years of water monitoring data. It might be a little small. Uh, on East and West Goose, so from 2007 to 2017, the nutrient levels are above state standards. So that's when they call this an impaired lake. Um, phosphorus is blue and the chlorophyll is red. As these dotted lines show, they're, they're way up there. So part of the puzzle, next slide, um, is getting them to be improved. Uh, we, we give each lake in our data a TSI. It's called a trophic indicator, a, a trophic status indicator. Um, our data spits out that number, and we convert that into a letter grade. So East and West Goose last year were a grade D. Um, they are not the brightest in the class of lakes. So on the next one, um, Goose Lake, as many have seen, I was just having a conversation about pea soup before we got started with a gentleman. And uh, it's because of that richness, that history of all those nutrients means that phosphorus is producing algae. One pound of phosphorus can produce 500 pounds of algae. So without the aquatic plants in the lake, uh, it's a cycle of nothing to support the lake bottom and it's being resuspended. And then warm weather and sun are producing the algae blooms. Um, because if there's nutrients in the lake, something's gonna use them. And without plants, then uh, algae's the first option. And another way to put that with the next icon is, it's too much of a good thing. So if you had ice cream all day long, uh, you're gonna get a stomach ache and it's gonna look something like Goose Lake. Um, so Goose Lake has had a stomach ache for quite a while. So we're gonna try to balance this out. On the next slide, uh, this is where uh, community effort comes in. We have options for homeowners, businesses, and uh, property owners, whether you're on the shoreline or not. So what can you do? Um, adopt a storm drain. This is one of the signups we have. We have an effort to clean out storm drains on volunteer schedules, on people's time. Um, you can clean that out so that grass clippings, trash, debris, things that bring more nutrients from the outside into the lake are limited. So it's a citizen effort across the metro. There's a new map, adoptadrain.org, coming in April. Uh, and that's part of the watershed partners across the metro. We will update everybody and start advertising that once that map's available in our area. 
But for now, uh, any effort at all to have this gold star effect, a uh, clean street is better for preventing flooding as well as uh, reducing those nutrients going into the lake. Next one, oh, this is, this is what not to do. And this familiar figure, as we know, is don't be like Eddie from a popular Christmas movie. And adoptadrain.org, like I said, is coming. We've got a couple pictures of, this is the service in action. It's a great family activity. And um, thanks to a resident who had helped us out previously, I won't call her out, but she's in this room and uh, is pictured. And she's been doing the adopt a drain effort with her granddaughter. And it's been a big support to get awareness out. So on our website, we have ways to get involved. Um, there's an icon here on the next one. Get Involved has the adopt drain information and storm drain stenciling and uh, medallion placing opportunities. So that's when, if you have a scout group, a community group, congregation, uh, we have a whole kit so that it can be an easy thing to check out. Residents can go down a street and target a few storm drains. Uh, we've got safety gear, we've got flyers. So that gets the word out. It lets um, residents and community groups be the educator on the ground. Um, if you have a group like that, you can call me. My card is on the back and we can set that up. On the next one, uh, your yard care, uh, proper salt techniques, um, how to manage uh, turf grass and water properly is, yeah, a, a larger conversation for another presentation. Oh, yeah, that's okay. And we'll have that information on the residence tab on the website. So that's available. And then we have our cost share program. Tyler back here as he waves have facilitates our cost shares. We have two levels, most common for Property owners is level one. We'll reimburse 75%, $2,000, up to $2,000 for these beautiful projects, a rain garden, a native planting. These are what we call best management practices for the upland areas that help the water quality later on when they get down to the lake. Another piece of that that can be funded in our cost share are shoreline restorations. So coming from uh, maybe turf grass all the way down to the water, a degraded shoreline that would have soil eroding. Uh, we can replant that and the result is native vegetation on the next one. Looks attractive. It's native flowers, for, great for pollinators, and it's a buffer to protect the lake. So that is something that's needed in some places on Goose Lake and we're here to support that. Next one. Uh, it's connecting with us as these other clipboards. We've got a seasonal newsletter and a volunteer newsletter. So you're not committing to anything, but if you want our seasonal newsletter, you can sign up for that. Or just to be in the know of when we do have volunteer activities, you can be uh, in the know to be at an event or uh, be able to learn more about that process of checking out a kit and uh, adopting a drain. Good afternoon. Uh, yes, and as uh, Nick was saying, I'm with Bar Engineering Company, and we are starting work on, on a couple of studies uh, that involve the watershed organization and that are specific to Goose Lake and the Goose Lake watershed. If you want to go ahead to my first slide here. Uh, and, and so, yeah, they maybe skip to the next one. I'll just kind of outline for you a couple things that, that I'll talk about today. So a lot of what Nick talked about are things that are really at a smaller scale, things that can be done to, to control phosphorus at maybe an individual landowner scale. And so some of what we're, we've been hired to look at is, is what if we could step out at scale and, and maybe consider implementing other projects that would, ha would also help to, to reduce phosphorus and the amount of phosphorus that gets to Goose Lake um, but, but have other treatment options for reducing phosphorus. And so th that is really what is the basis for a watershed-based funding project that the WMO has started. 
uh, and that we're working on, and we're just we just are underway within the last month of, of trying to obtain information. If you want to go to the next slide, uh, and and so I'll give you an update on on that project right now. If you want to skip to the next one, it's just a map. It's very similar to what um, Nick was showing earlier with the watershed and the, the east and west coast lake up here. And so what we're in the stages of, of compiling information and kind of get our mapping together because what we're really going to do is, is concentrate on two things. One, we're going to do some uh, computer modeling of the amount of phosphorus that, that's in our stormwater runoff from this, this area that does drain to the two lake basins. And then we're also going to look at, at estimating what we have to do to control the stormwater runoff. So in circumstances where we get really large storm events, how will we handle that? Uh, some of what you hopefully can see here are some light brown lines, and these represent the storm sewer network. And so in the same way that you have sewer lines that take away your sanitary waste, we also have uh, storm sewer lines that are in the streets that are conveying the stormwater runoff. And so uh, Nick had a lot of pictures of catch basins, and so these are the, the these are storm sewer lines are, are what ultimately take that water down to the lake. Uh, after it, it is accepted by the, the catch basins. And so that's one of the bits of information that we're collecting on this, in this uh, watershed that drains to the lake. Uh, and, and so there's a number of different uh, entities that are, that are managing those uh, storm sewer systems. And so we're trying to map all that out. Um, MnDOT being one of them, we're trying to get some more information uh, as it pertains to the, to the Highway 61 corridor here and everything that drains in there. But you can see there's a number of places here where it ultimately comes together and just a few major outfalls that do drain to, the, to each one of the, the lake basins. And then I've got a bunch of other sim symbols on here. Uh, I'm identifying where ponds are located in this, in this watershed area. And then rainwater gardens. If you've gone along County Road E, there's a number of, uh, of these rainwater gardens that are in the boulevard. So very similar to some of the pictures that Nick showed you. Um, there's a number of those out there, and so we're really inventorying everything that might be doing something for us in regards to uh, removing phosphorus in the stormwater runoff. And so these are these yellow practices here are the things that we want to take into account. We have Oak Knoll Pond in the middle of the watershed, and it also has some, some BMPs or some best management practices that are removing phosphorus and sediment before it goes into the pond. But then ultimately the, the flow from that pond does go downstream to Goose Lake as well. So our computer modeling is going to try to estimate for us where we think we're going to get the best benefit in the future by putting in some of these other structural practices. And they can be things like rainwater gardens. They can be a, a squirrel practice here. This is actually a, like a manhole that, that is designed to remove sediment and, uh, and treat it before it moves downstream. And so there are other practices like that, as well as just our traditional ponds. And there's a number of other ponds in the watershed. And then these uh, retention pipes, these are areas that are kind of up in the, in farther up into the watershed, and they're specifically designed to, to abstract some of the initial flow of, of stormwater that, uh, that first runs off in these, these upper parts of the watershed and then infiltrated into the ground. And so there are practices like that that we want to to consider and take those into account. And so everything that we're doing is, is intended to do one thing, to, to uh, capture exactly what's happening today, where we think everything is running off, where it's going, how much we're already removing with these existing practices that are both in yellow and in purple here. And then, um, and then ultimately create a, an estimate of where we think we can start to, to make improvements on that and combine that with the other efforts that everybody else is doing at a local level to ultimately reduce the amount of phosphorus that gets to the two lake basins. And then along with that, consider uh, in-lake or in-pond practices. And uh, one of the things that went into it goes into that thinking is that we had done some monitoring. Tyler and Brian back there had, had been out and uh, noticed that uh, with some monitoring that they did on the pond that in the summer, some of the phosphorus was coming out of the sediment in that particular pond. We know we've got that problem with some of the other ponds in the watershed. 
And so it's a, actually a problem that is metro-wide. It's kind of a metro-wide problem. We're in a situation where we, we have a lot of constructed ponds and a lot of natural wetlands, too, that in the summer uh, sediment chemistry starts to change when, when the uh, water, uh, water goes uh, anoxic or where it becomes devoid of, of oxygen. And then the phosphorus can actually get released from the sediment. And so that's, that's a phenomenon that we've already witnessed and monitored in Goose Lake itself. Uh, but we want to be cognizant of that for ponds. And so uh, when we saw that happening, and we've seen it happen in a lot of other watersheds, um, the, the idea was, was to consider w whether or not we've got other alternative treatment options for uh, mitigating that or, or, or preventing phosphorus from being released from sediment for many of these types of water bodies. And so if you want to go to the next slide, I'll start to talk about that. We've had a number of, chem of, of uh, success stories with using chemicals to treat these sediments so that it seals off the, the, the phosphorus that would otherwise get released. It combines with that phosphorus and prevents it from getting released into the water column. And uh, these uh, chemical treatments come at a cost. Um, a lot of times you're, you're uh, buying a, 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 a chemical that we're already using for our, our drinking water and, uh, and applying that to the, to the lake or to the pond. And, and so th there's a cost associated with that. And uh, depending on how you do it, um, there's some other considerations in terms of how well it might work for you long term. One, uh, one uh, material that we already have available is, is kind of actually a waste product of the St. Paul Wa uh, regional uh, water services and they, they, it's called spent lime and so um, lime is getting used to, uh, to soften the water at the, at the drinking water utility and one of the, the, the waste products from that process is, is something called spent lime and so what we had noticed if you want to go to the next slide is that that is a chemical that has had some we've started using it for two things one to look at at removing phosphorus from um, from stormwater runoff in a, in a in a almost in like a smaller catchment area that where we can treat that amount of the, the phosphorus that's in the stormwater runoff, and and so uh, or could we also consider using it to seal off the and and prevent the phosphorus that gets released from ponds or or some of these other um, smaller water bodies, and so really what we ended up doing in conjunction with the WMO and actually the Ramsey Washington Metro Watershed District as well and we're partnering with the St. Paul Regional Water Services here and so our team is really intending to 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 look at this study as a as a pilot scale option for reducing phosphorus but using a, a, a like I said spent line which is a waste product of the water treatments process to, to look at two ponds, Oak Knoll Pond in the, that I just pointed out in the map, and then Wakefield Pond is in the Ramsey Washington Metro Watershed District, so just farther to our south and east here. And, um, and really then look at what it can do for us to prevent that phosphorus release from the bottom of these, these water bodies in the, in the watershed. What we're gonna do is do enough monitoring after we apply the spent lime to each of those ponds so that we can can get a mass balance on the um, and estimate exactly how much phosphorus comes into these ponds and how much is leaving and then by difference we will know whether or not this this pilot study will be successful at controlling phosphorus so that's the intent and the goal and the, maybe a summary of that i can uh, give you a little more background on what what it really is if you want to go to the next slide is it hung up there <laughs> Like I said, we've had some success using it for uh, treating stormwater runoff. So this is, this is another location in the Wakefield uh, Lake watershed. And um, stormwater comes in here. The white stuff, this is the spent lime. So this actually gets, uh, goes through a filter press when it comes out of the water treatment plant. And then they, they uh, today what they're doing at the water utility is they take that, like I said, it's waste product. They're actually spending a million dollars per year to truck it to agricultural producers. And the ag producers are applying it to their fields to, uh, for pH adjustment, because it's actually a higher pH material. 
And so, but that comes, like I said, that comes at a cost for disposing of it. What we noticed when we started use this for Ramsey, Washington, was that we can actually put it in a, at a little uh, place here where the storm sewer comes in and it, and it um, comes in contact with the stormwater before it goes out and out through this, uh, this uh, uh, standpipe. And when the stormwater comes in contact with it, the, the, the uh, spent lime re, uh, combines with the phosphorus and, and takes it out of solution. And then what leaves that, that um, stormwater treatment area is, is actually going to have a somewhat lower phosphorus concentration before it goes into, in this case, into Wakefield Lake. And so we had success with that. If you want to go to the next slide, um, this actually shows some of the monitoring data. So these green lines here, the green line shows the amount of phosphorus coming in. These are concentrations that right now are about what comes into this treatment area is about three times higher than what, what our goals are for Goose Lake. But you can see that the concentration, and this is dissolved phosphorus, it says orthophosphate. So that's actually the dissolved component. But what le is leaving that area that I just showed you in the picture is, is at a level that's less than half of, uh, of what the goal is for Goose Lake. So we think if we can uh, get that same kind of treatment, but uh, have it combined with the places in the in the uh, ponds where we're releasing phosphorus right now uh, that we can you know we can really start to see a, an improvement in the amount of phosphorus that, that uh, ultimately goes downstream to Goose Lake. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide the way that we've got some confidence in that is that we've actually set up and taken sediment in this case this was done in the early 90s, uh, uh, sediment was taken from Goose Lake. We have a limnology lab at our office. And what we do is we, um, we look at the amount of phosphorus that accumulates in a water column, where it's just a, a column set up where the sediment is on the bottom. And then we, look, we subject it to an anoxic condition. So we remove the, the, the dissolved oxygen, and then that causes the sediment chemistry to change so that phosphorus starts to get released. And so, we calculate how much phosphorus is getting released each day. Um, each point up here represents a, a point in the, uh, an amount of phosphorus that was released from the sediment. And so this is kind of our control experiment. And then we, we, can, we can estimate what that translates to for the amount of phosphorus that you would have seen in Goose Lake uh, under the existing condition. In this case, we, what we did was we estimated based on what we know about the spent lime, how much would we need to apply to that sediment to prevent uh, phosphorus release? And then we tried different doses. And in what I show here is the second graph for the same sediment. We subject it to just 25% of the dose, and that actually eliminated the phosphorus release. So just in our experiment. So we, it, it didn't, uh, it just took a little bit of spent lime to prevent that. So we know we've got that is a potential chemical that if we can start to use some of that, um, that saves money for the water utility, but, and we don't have to buy aluminum or some other chemical and apply that. And, um, and so we're hopeful that this pilot project, because it's got outside funding from the Minnesota Stormwater Research Council. And so that, uh, the partner, the project team that I talked about, um, we're going to use that funding to to look at this at, uh, with Oak Knoll Pond and with the, the Wakefield Pond that I talked about in the earlier slide. And so I don't know if I have any more slides after this. I probably don't. I've got one more. So we've got, it, I talked about other chemicals that can be used. Traditionally, what, what folks are doing in, in a, at a city uh, level is they're having to go in and either dredge, you know, the sediment out, and then that in turn provides somewhat of a solution for uh, phosphorus reduction. It helps to increase the storage as well. Sometimes there's a lot of sediment that does build up in these ponds. It's good to, to take that out. Um, but the drawback, obviously, is that it's expensive. Another chemical that we're used to using, we know it's proven. It doesn't matter if it's, if it's devoid of oxygen. It still works. We know that it works well. Um, but then the longevity of that is, is, uh, starts to be affected by the amount of stormwater that comes in. And it, it obviously is going to be more expensive than spent lime because you do have to buy it in the same way that the water utility buys their 
lime and their other chemicals today. So spent lime is the one that I was just talking about. We know it's, it, the benefit is likely that it's going to be cheaper. We don't know, you know what is the cost benefit ratio. And so these are the two things that we want to we want to do with we want to address with this um, with this pilot project, and then long term we'll want to know you know how well does spent lime work. If it does work in the first year, I'm sure we'll be back to, in the future to to keep an eye on it and see that it does have some longevity to it. The only other option that folks consider sometimes when they do have problems with phosphorus release in ponds is is aeration. And there again, it's, it can be a very expensive, and then it's not always beneficial in some circumstances. Uh, it may just really just um, stir up the water more than anything else, and then really all you're doing is, is mobilizing the phosphorus so that when it goes downstream, it, it becomes available for, for algae. So. So I didn't mention at the beginning, but my name is Dawn. I'm the program development coordinator, and I'm the one who's been writing to you. So we really appreciate you coming out. Um, Nick and I also worked on the article that you may have seen in the Vadnais Heights Press. So we really want to get the information out because we want to have everybody involved in this process. Goose Lake isn't the only lake around in the metro area that has these kinds of problems. Greg mentioned that too. But Como Lake is another lake in St. Paul that's dealing with a lot of the very same questions. So we are also talking with other watersheds, other WMOs, and looking to see how is their process going so that we can learn from them and we can really compile all of this information together. We don't need to all be making the same mistakes. We want to all be helping each other along and making the same improvements. So I want you to know that that's going on also. And as we look ahead, so one of the issues in Goose Lake is the limited plant diversity. I have a slide coming up in just a moment that talks about some of the surveys we've done to figure out what's in the lake. And we know that there's not a lot of native plant diversity out there. There are a few types of plants, otherwise it's mostly algae. And as we look to the future, we're going to be getting these BMPs, best management practices, installed in the landscape, reducing the nutrient loads, hopefully trying spent lime or some other techniques to clarify the water. As we clear up the water, we want to know, well, what comes next? How do we put a healthy plant community back into this lake so that we end up with a functional habitat and a functional ecosystem in this lake where it's been severely impaired so far? One of the issues as we look at this is curly leaf pondweed you are probably much more familiar with it directly than I am. I've been reading a tremendous about, amount about it, but I don't have a lot of personal experience with it yet, but I plan to get a lot more. So curly leaf pondweed is very well established in West Goose, and that has also been controlled by the Midwest ski otters. They've done some chemical treatments in a few years ago, and they've done mechanical treatments to try to remove enough to keep the recreation a quality high enough to be able to use it. But curly leaf pondweed is also creeping into East Goose through the culverts where the lakes are connected. And so we want to look at those areas and work to target those areas to prevent the spread of curly leaf pondweed into East Goose Lake. What you see here is a picture. Curly leaf pondweed can be confused with other pondweeds. There are also native pondweeds. And I'll show some examples of those also coming up. But this, this kind of um, folded serrated, almost tooth structure is, is unique to the curly leaf pondweed. And one of the things that makes it such a hard plant to be able to treat in a lake system is the turians that it forms. There's one forming here and on the next slide you'll see one. it looks almost like a little brown pine cone kind of structure, though not nearly as hard. And those turians end up in the sediment, they move away from the plants and they grow new plants. So this is a real issue, curly leaf pondweed, in East and West Goose that we want to work on because as the water clarity improves, we want a healthy functioning vegetation community in there. Some things about curly leaf pondweed that make it especially difficult to treat and to deal with is that it starts to grow really early in the season. So we are talking with researchers from the University of Minnesota who also work on other lakes that have curly leaf pondweed. We're also working with DNR to work on our plans for treating curly leaf pondweed, but depending on our winter. And this year we're having a fairly mild winter. So the curly leaf pondweed is gonna get a real boost. It will start to grow even before the ice is out. It reaches its peak in spring, by midsummer, it starts to die off, and so it, it forms dense mats and really prevents native plant establishment in places where it's present. So there's some, just some things about its life cycle that make it especially difficult to be able to address. And this shows one of the turians down here. 
Um, this is a species that the University of Minnesota is doing a lot of research on, looking at new techniques, ways of being able to address it. It is fairly widespread, and we know that it's going to be a difficult one if we really want to be able to remove it. Our opportunity right now is to look at East Goose, where it isn't well established yet, and to try to prevent it from becoming more widely established. Before we can try to get rid of something, we need to know what's in there. So Vlamo has been working on that over the years, conducting vegetation surveys. The first one was done in 2010. That was done in August, and as I was talking about the life cycle of curly leaf pondweed, that's going to die back by midsummer, so it's not really going to be present. And so when the survey was done in August, it was probably too late to capture curly leaf pondweed in the lake, though we know it was there. That survey did find Elodia, and it also found leafy pondweed. So Vlamo knew, well, we need more information, we need better information because we know the curly leaf pondweed is in there. So a follow-up survey was done in June, great timing to find the curly leaf pondweed, and that did indeed document curly leaf pondweed in the lake and noted key locations where it was found. But we still don't know exactly how widespread it is. So that's a piece of information that we want to know more about. So we are collaborating with researchers from the university who will help us figure out when the best time is to get maximum population levels of the curly leaf pondweed. They'll let us know as the ice is out. We're talking with Ramsey Soil and Water Conservation also. They are going to be doing the survey for us. And they are preparing in that one week post ice out on the lake. They want to be out there um, documenting the vegetation and actually documenting areas, so drawing a line around the areas where the curly leaf pondweed is found and telling us exactly where it is. But one week post ice out might not be the perfect time. So that's why we want to be talking and collaborating with others who are doing this work so that we can identify the best time. So we'll find that best time, we'll let Ramsey County know, and we'll get that survey done so that we know exactly how widespread is curly leaf pondweed, especially in East Goose Lake, though we know it's a problem in West Goose as well. So we want to find out where the curly leaf pondweed is. We also want to have an idea of how can we work to put that plant community back together. We know that we have limited plant diversity in the lake. One of the first things we want to do is as the water clarity improves, we want to see if there's native vegetation that is left in the seed bank. That means seeds that are down there in the sediment that can still grow and be healthy plants, but it's really that phosphorus that's preventing and the algae growth that's preventing that from happening. So we want to watch, but we also want to be prepared to try to put some of the native plant community back to give it a boost especially in the culvert areas where the curly leaf pondweed is likely to be competing with natives. Those are areas we'd like to target with putting native species back into the lake. And so we've been working with DNR to identify key species that we might like to put back in the lake. That's based on research that has been done in the area. I'll show a little bit more information about that in a moment. But we have just a one minute video that I'd like to share with you right now. And this is just the trailer. The full video is linked on the website. And this shows some work being done in the metro area to look at native plant communities in our lakes because shallow lakes have some unique characteristics and fairly abundant native vegetation usually. And that may be a condition that is desirable for habitat for a lot of species, including fish in the lake. And so maybe something that we wanna know a bit more about. This video also mentions carp, and we don't have carp in Goose Lake, but we do have bullheads that are native, but they are doing some of the same activities that carp would. So just know we're, we're not introducing also now that carp is a problem in Goose Lake, but rather this is something that's going on as part of the effort to improve quality of shallow lakes. We're very Minnesotan about our lakes, meaning that we want all lakes to be all things to all people and they really don't work that way. Shallow lakes exist in two states. They either want to be in a turbid, algae-dominated lake where the water is really green or brown, there's not a lot of vegetation, or they want to be in a clear water state that's dominated by plants. I think people should care about clean water in lakes. It's not only about vegetation coming back to the lake, right, but that creates habitat for fish and ducks and all kinds of other creatures. I think that overall as a community, we are all concerned about the health of our lakes. It's our property values, it's where kids swim. So we are very interested in being educated. The full video is fantastic and it's Linked on our website, it's about 10 minutes long if you want to look it up after the meeting today. Can we switch back? I definitely recommend it. There's some great information and links to some really interesting projects that are going on that do relate to 
our issues in Goose Lake. So as we think about native vegetation, one of those things, well, why would we want to put a lot of vegetation back in there? It's one of the problems. Well, curly leaf pondweed is a really dense, a nasty problem. It's an invasive species. It doesn't belong in that lake. But having a diverse plant community is appropriate for this lake. So we have a permit that's been approved, but we won't be doing any transplant work until the water quality itself improves. So these BMP strategies that we're talking about going into the landscape, Vlamo will continue to do monitoring to find out what's happening with the phosphorus levels. And as the water quality improves, that's when we want to be ready to do some more native vegetation work. To get ready for that, we got this permit in place and in our conversations with the DNR, we found out that the only option really for us in our watershed is Gem Lake as a lake that has a healthy native plant community and is not listed as infested. It doesn't have any other known invasive species in it. We would not want to introduce another problem into Goose Lake, absolutely. And so Gem Lake is a possibility. It's healthy, it's not infested, and we should be able to find our target native species there. But that's one of the things we're going to be working on this summer is doing a little bit of exploring around Gem Lake to identify areas where these particular native plant species that we would like to bring into Goose Lake possibly in the future where their plant communities are really healthy and where we might be able to bring some individuals in, especially in those culvert areas, to combat the curly leaf pondweed that's in there. We think that Gem Lake is going to be terrific, but we want to do some work to really find out what's in there. And if it doesn't work for some reason, if there are some species that are not appropriate, we can't find some of our target species, we have a couple of other options that the DNR has recommended to us. They would have high quality native species in them also. They are not infested, but we cross county lines. And so we would have more permissions that we would need to do to get that done. So we'll be looking at Gem Lake. We'll be talking to people living around Gem Lake too, sharing information with them. So this is a project that we're, we're setting the groundwork right now. As Goose Lake gets better, we want these kinds of things to be ready to go so that we can really put the system back together. A lot of this work is based on Lake Susan. I mentioned the researchers at the university. Lake Susan is down here by Chan Hassan. They've already been doing transplant work. They identified key species that are native to Minnesota that have a high likelihood of success after being transplanted to both grow and reproduce. They're found at the depths that are appropriate in Goose Lake. And here are some of those species. Not that you have to look at this slide and memorize all of these species, but these are the six species that they worked with for that research study. These are the ones that we proposed to DNR. And as we worked on building this permit for transplanting vegetation, they said, we don't want any northern water milfoil to be transplanted because, you know, we can't, we can, we'll do a good job of our identification with plants, but they want to be sure that we're not accidentally going to put Eurasian water milfoil in there. And so northern water milfoil is off the list, but we did add two more that are natives. And these two are also available through some local nurseries and their local, cult their local plants that have been harvested from our area. So they're going to have good genetic diversity and a likelihood of surviving in our area. They're adapted to our climate and local conditions. And we can purchase some of those in addition to collecting some as we work on this plan. And one of the other signups that we have available for you today Vlamo is going to be learning a lot about these native submerged plant species. And as we learn that information, we'd like to share it with you. So if you would be interested this summer in attending a workshop on native submerged plant species, we've got one of our sign-up sheets over here. We will be happy to let you know when we're going to offer a workshop, and we would be happy to teach you about the different native plants that are found in our watershed and that would be good candidates for a future in Goose Lake. The final clipboard is our search for uh, two aquatic invasive species detectors. So uh, one for east, one for west Goose Lake. Uh, it's a volunteer effort that uh, we are partnering with, with Ramsey County. It's the Ramsey Soil and Water Conservation Division. And uh, it basically consists of throwing a rake out into the water and being familiar with the vegetation enough to know that uh, to, to detect if a new species is present. If a new invasive species is present, there's a whole process to go through to alert people and say, well, check this out. Maybe we can treat this before it's established. So this whole program is a way to have people on the ground, 
people who live close and on the lake to be a valuable part of those eyes on the water, so to speak. Um, so that's a, a sign-up that if we have multiple uh, folks interested, uh, we'll just uh, do a conversation to know what's a good fit, uh, what other volunteer efforts are people interested in. So um, we'd be happy if there's more than two interested, but we'll, we'll stick to two because Vlamo is going to fund the tools, the rope and the rake, to uh, help that out. And then we'll work with the county to uh, attend another workshop. So the county teaches residents how to detect invasive species. So you're, you'll be equipped. Um, and if you have questions about that, uh, talk to me after and then uh, sign up on that clipboard. Mm -hmm.